Thanks, guys. Uh, so my name is Drew Schmidt. I am the uh, lead analyst for the GuidePoint Research and Intelligence team. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about ransomware rebranding and ultimately why it's so hot right now. So a little bit about me. I've been in IT, InfoSec, SOC, Defer, Threat Intel, Malware for quite a while. Um, I kind of landed on malware. That's one of the things I just really like to uh, to dive into and, and really kind of put a lot of my time. Um, but enough about that. Um, we can talk later about who I am and, and what I do. But what I want to get into is, is ransomware rebranding. So to start off, I just want to take a little bit of a step back and just look at ransomware rebranding as it's occurred since basically 2020, and then getting get into a little bit of case studies to look at why ransomware rebranding is so effective. Then I want to get into some tips and tricks for how we can actually identify what ransomware rebranding is doing and, and how it's progressing through from rebrand to rebrand before we figure out, you know, how do we take all this information and put um, a lot of this knowledge to work? Um, the last talk did a really good, uh, really good explanation of, of a lot of that piece. So uh, I'm glad that happened beforehand, but um, we'll kind of wrap it up with that. So to start with, ransomware rebranding, it's so hot right now. Um, Hive, right in the middle, um, is going to be probably a really good example of why rebranding is, is so successful and ultimately why it's important for us to take a look into rebranding so that we can stay up to date with what threat actors are doing. So to begin with, this is a graph of publicly posted ransomware victims from 2022. And this comes straight out of our annual ransomware report that we just put out last week. Um, and what you see in the blue uh, or in the solid line is the number of posts that went on uh, throughout 2022. The dotted green line is actually the number of groups that were active at any given week during, um, during 2022. So the one thing really to to, to pay attention to, other than the fact that ransomware is obviously a huge problem, is at any given time, there were 11.2 active groups that were posting victims to public sites. Now, this is a very high number, and, and ultimately, as we go through 2022, we see that this number went up and down. So when we think about ransomware as a, a large problem, obviously, that's obvious. But as we dive in a little bit deeper, we can see exactly why it's a problem and why it's a little bit harder for us to track from a CTI perspective. So to start with, ransomware rebranding has been around for quite a while. We've seen groups like Maze, we've seen Gancrab become Rebel, we've seen Egregor, Hive, Conti, a whole bunch of Evil Corp variations. All this has been going on for a long time, even longer than we've been talking about it as rebranding. So... One of the things that we did was we wanted to break this down a little bit more, get a little bit more granular to, to have a taxonomy for how we should talk about ransomware and specifically rebranding. So on the x-axis of this little chart here, we have kind of the duration of operations. And on the y-axis, we have activity. And so we came up with this idea where we have different types of groups. One is going to be full-time. These are the groups that are operating for long periods of time. They have long, consistent activity. They have well-established infrastructure, well-established TTPs, and they're operating for, again, a very long time. Now, rebrands are going to be kind of the, the offshoots of a full-time uh, group that have to go through a rebrand for any number of reasons. Hive is going to be a great example of what we see in terms of rebrand activity. Now, splinter groups are going to be more of an offshoot. Maybe it's uh, an affiliate that decides to go out on their own, or it's going to be some other smaller group that is an offshoot from either a full-time or a rebrand group. A little bit more erratic, less established TTPs, um, and ultimately they haven't been around for, for all that long. And lastly, we have ephemeral groups. Now, these are, the, are very interesting because they're the ones that are a flash in the pan. They're there for a second, then they're not. And these particular groups might be used for any kind of uh, specific targeted operation, um, but ultimately they're there for such a short period of time that all they really do is add a lot of noise for us. So the thing to understand about the way that we think about ransomware groups and, and the taxonomy that we created is that a lot of these groups will move between different types. They may start as ephemeral and move into a splinter group or ultimately full-time, or maybe they come in as a rebrand and move to full-time. But there's a lot of movement that happens with ransomware groups. And so what this results in and, and what we found is when we break this down into these different types of groups, we see some interesting trends. So the dark blue or the, uh, the lighter blue line, rather, is going to be our full-time groups. And as 22, or 2022 progressed, uh, 
we actually see their activity being pretty consistent with a little bit of a drop towards Q4. The darker line, uh, darker blue line is going to be rebrands. And those are the ones that started off 2022 a little bit lower and steadily progressed through the remainder of 2022 and ultimately converged with the full-time groups, which is exactly what you would expect when you think about what a, what a rebrand group is and what they do. Now, what's a little bit more interesting is when we start taking a look at splinter groups and ephemeral groups and how I mentioned that a lot of times these groups are ultimately causing some noise for us. These are consistent, uh, they are, there were consistent trends throughout pretty much all of 2022 with respect to splinter groups and ephemeral groups and how they actually popped up and went away at any given time. So again, that noise makes it a little bit more difficult for us to track these ransomware groups as they go throughout 2022. Um, and ultimately, um, when you break them into individual categories, you see how they contribute to the overall ransomware activity at any given time. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why ransomware rebrands? And ultimately, it goes down into the five Ds of rebranding, which is dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. In all seriousness, all seriousness, though, a lot of what we're doing here is we're flying under the radar. We want to make it harder for intelligence analysts to track. We want to make it uh, easier for us to extend our operations or for the threat actors to extend their operations. And we just ultimately, or they ultimately don't want to be caught, right? And so that is the entire purpose of rebranding. So what does this do to us? Well, it's another group for us to track. It's another leak site to scrape. There's a whole slew of behaviors and TTPs we need to learn. There's all kinds of intelligence that ends up being fed through this never ending cycle. So it's ultimately harder on us, right? And that's exactly what they want. So my wife actually took this picture of me when I was preparing for this, looking at some of the case studies um, of ransomware rebranding. And so I really wanted to take a look and show you guys how effective ransomware rebranding can be. So to begin, we have all of these different groups and they all operate on different, uh, different life cycles. So this chart shows you the active days or the average days that group, any one type of group was active in 2022. Full-time groups unsurprisingly were the most active. They're operating pretty much all year. Rebrands are going to be active in the, um, you know, a little bit less than a full-time group, but they're starting to approach that full-time status. That's their goal. They went from probably a, a previous full-time group to a rebrand, and now they're trying to achieve that status again. The splinter groups are usually going to be, you know, affiliates that have experience in the game, and they're moving forward to really achieve that long-term status and that full-time status. But the one thing that's really interesting here is the ephemeral groups, and those let, only lasted on average 21 days. Um, again, this makes it difficult for us from a CTI perspective to make sure that we're tracking these groups, we're defining TTPs, behaviors, and really starting to use that to um, inform um, our risk profiles and how we're going to use this type of data to effectively track ransomware and, and the threats that we face. So the first case study that I dove into here was dark side to black matter to alpha. So to start here, we have dark side that, that was active for about 200 days. Um, then we had black matter that took over for about 90 days. And then we got into alpha, which has been operating basically ever since. So when you actually look at the timeline, there's two very distinct dates that correlate with the rebrands. The first one was the colonial pipeline attack. The second one was a shutdown from black matter saying they're getting pressure from authorities. So during this whole time, going from you know, 2020 all the way through 2021 and into 2023, there have been very uh, distinct points where this particular group has found themselves in the spotlight. And when they did that, they went through a rebrand. Now, when they did this, uh, the first time they actually did a rebrand from Dark Side to Black Matter, that lasted, or that rebrand took less than 60 days. They obviously learned a little bit because the next time they went through a rebrand, they did it in less than 30. Now, as you like, basically from these numbers, you can see that the overall level of effort is going down and the reward definitely pays off. This group was able to extend their operations for over 400 days. And every day that Alpha is active now moving forward, it's just another day that they've extended their operations. So from this perspective, you can see how effective it was to actually rebrand to a couple of different groups here. 
Another really great example is going to be Evil Corp. So I'm sure we've all heard of Evil Corp. We've all, um, you know, experienced intelligence related to Evil Corp. They started their uh, ransomware operations with BitPamer, and they were active for several years before they started to really get put on things like sanctions lists and and started getting um, a lot of heat from you know the intelligence community. Uh, and then that's when they started going through their rebranding process. So they went through Wasted Locker, Hades, Phoenix Locker, Payload Bin, McCall Locker. And all of these had a different um, period of time that they were active. But what you can see is that they got so good at rebranding that they were able to put out a new rebranded ransomware in about 21 days, which is consistent with the data that we uh, saw with some of our ephemeral uh, rebrand data from 2022. So what's interesting about how Evil Corp did some of their operations with, was that there is some overlapping from when they were going through different rebrands. Um, as and as time went on, their rebrands became much more quick or, or shorter in duration, just showing, again, how effective some of these operations are. Now, especially towards the end when we got to McCall Locker, um, they were already on the sanctions list for the U.S. Treasury, so you couldn't actually pay them. The hope, I think, from their perspective was if we can rebrand fast enough, we can start getting our ransomware out there and we can actually receive payments before anybody realizes that we uh, that McCall Locker was uh, a part of the Evil Corp tool set. And so this is another example where the average rebrand duration was about 38 days, got way shorter during the end. But again, we, we extend, they extended their operations for over 400 days which is huge when you think about how much money a lot of these ransomware groups are making at any given time for any one ransom, um, and even more when you factor in the, the double extortion aspects of this. So knowing that rebrands are a thing and knowing that they're so effective, well, what are the tips and tricks? And, and how can we use these tips and tricks to make sure that we are effective at identifying ransomware rebranding? The first thing to start with here, and this is the best example of identifying um, you know, technical information and, and concrete facts and evidence to identify ransomware rebranding. And this was a report by Sentinel Labs. Um, it, it's the best example that I've seen to date of actually uh, confirming and, and factually based evidence um, for identifying rebranding. And so a lot of what we're doing when we're spotting these rebrands is how are they doing certain things? How are they doing file and drive enumeration? How are they proceeding with encryption? How are they doing API hashing or import routines? Any number of different pieces of functionality that you would see in ransomware. If we can start to identify things, you know, and styles that individual developers are doing, that's one thing that we can then take and implement so that we can identify that same type of uh, style in other ransomwares. Now, for all of you guys who, who um, Remember the '90s? There was a movie called Blank Check, and that's where that little uh, get or that little meme uh, came in at the end. So one of my favorite movies, and, and wish that I could do it when I was a kid. But anyway, um, so big thing here is just continuing to identify ways to identify these ransomware rebrands. So one of the big things that we can do is in-depth code analysis. So especially when we see uh, source code that's leaked, for instance, on the right-hand side, we have Conti's source code that was leaked. We can actually take some of that and we can then identify key components of what happened in, or what's being used in that code, how it's done, the style that's associated with it. And we can put that in our arsenal to be able to detect that being used in other samples. On the left-hand side, we could use uh, uh, certain tools like Bindiff to look at routines that exist in one sample, but maybe don't exist in another, or they definitely exist in both. And that's how we can start looking for that code reuse we can start making sure that we're tracking these things and identifying when these types of uh, these pieces of code are used from sample to sample. Again, looking at trying to identify that in other variants. One thing to keep in mind here is that leak sites are code too. There is HTML code that's associated with developing these leak sites. And if we can start identifying the uh, similar types of code used in leak sites, that's another way that we can we can detect um, when certain groups are going through a rebrand process. So that's just something to keep in mind. And so, you know, this is something that I think the last talk covered really well, but I think the big thing here is as we go through all of these different components, right? We're looking at code, we're looking at leak sites, 
let's make sure we're making this work for us. So whether it's Yara, whether it's figuring out how to contribute to Lumina, whether that's adding uh, signatures into your different sandboxes or other routines for Ghidra, however we're doing this, we just have to make sure that all this information that we're gathering is being put to work. And that's uh, you know one of the biggest components for how we're going to build these long-term capabilities to identify when rebranding is happening. The last thing here really for, for tips and tricks is we need to start profiling behaviors. So as much as there's, behavior, there's style in how developers are creating things and the fact that many developers, including myself, are lazy and we want to reuse code whenever we possibly can because it's faster, um, we just want to make sure that we're profiling the behaviors. So whether it's TTPs in terms of initial intrusion or post-exploitation, um, you know, that's something we need to keep track of. Negotiation tactics. One of the things that, that my team does is threat active negotiations. And so figuring out what kind of negotiation tactics do these groups use may be very helpful in defining their, their profile. Um, any kind of dark web identities, how they communicate, going through um, how they go through rebrands, you know, getting into tracking that long term. Um, any kind of financial behaviors or relationships with other e-crime groups, these are all important things that we want to add to a living threat profile. So a lot of times the tendency is develop this profile and it's going to serve us now and in the future. But it, the unfortunate reality is threat actors move fast. They change fast. And so we need to keep up with this. We need to have a living threat profile that develops as these threat actors develop themselves. The one thing I want to take a step back on here and, and talk about is just some of the pitfalls. And so we have to watch out because there is an entire ecosystem that, that services ransomware groups, and it's, it's quite large. So it's a tendency when we see something right out of the gate to have um, you know, quick attribution. We want, to, we want to tie that to a group. We want to say, hey, it was uh, you know, something we saw is definitely locked in. And we want to do that quickly and move forward. But there is a difference between the actual core group of developers and some of the affiliates, right? And so there's um, some of this extension where media and others are going to want to really provide that attribution quickly. We kind of have to take a step back, especially because ransomware as a service really complicates things. Um, outsourcing is a real thing. A lot of these threat actors want to use um, some of the, the quickest and best ways to get the functionality they need. And so when you look at something like code reuse between Lockbit 3 and Black Matter, clearly there's something going on there that we need to incorporate into our intelligence to make sure we understand what's going on there and not jump to a conclusion and say, hey, Lockbit 3 and, and Black Matter are the same group. <clears throat> um, another thing is ransomware groups have leaks. I think Conti is a great example of this. They went through a huge leak, which probably forced most of their rebrand uh, to actually occur. And so their playbooks were released, their source code was, was released. So we need to make sure we don't have a tendency to just step back and say, hey, I saw this playbook, it's used by a different group, you know, that must be Conti. Well, we have to, we have to really put it through its paces here and say, is that something that's a little bit more widespread? Or is it truly something that is defined by that group? Um, Large groups have options. There's just a lot of stuff going on with how they operate. They have a lot of relationships of their own. So really what I'm what this means is it, it does make it a lot harder for us on the blue team side of things, on the intelligence side of things. Um, but this is where we have to make a lot of this data work for us. We need to have long-term trends, use our data to really establish um, you know, these rebranding activities. And so what is the point of all this really? We want to take Happy Hacker and make them into sad hacker. We want to make them rebrand so often, we want to make sure we force their hands so often that it no longer becomes a, a very uh, monetizable strategy to just rebrand. So if we can force them to have to go through that process over and over again, eventually they're gonna start losing money and that's exactly what we're looking to do here. And so with all of this, what, what do we do now? The first thing is communicating what I call the single source of truth. So we have threat intelligence as part of a bigger cybersecurity group or a fusion center or however your organization looks at it. But the biggest thing we need to do is all of this intelligence that's coming in, all of this research from various um, organizations, 
we want to make sure that we're communicating this. If we're not communicating this and groups like the SOC can't take any action or executives can't properly define risk, then we're not doing something right with our program and, and our capabilities. So when we are disseminating this intelligence, we need to focus on a couple of key characteristics. We want it to be something that can be consumed and we want it to be actionable. If they're not able to consume the intelligence you're providing and they can't take any action on it, then I don't think that you're actually providing intelligence. We want to make sure that that intelligence is also highly contextualized. So if you're providing something that's not relevant to your industry or not relevant to your organization, it's likely that it's just not relevant and, and able to be used by the various teams that are going to be benefiting from your intelligence. So again, making sure that it's relevant, focusing on your industry, focusing on your organization, making sure that they also get that in a timely manner. If they're getting threat intelligence that's a month old, obviously that's not very actionable and they're not getting that in a way that's gonna be beneficial to the team. Um, another thing is, is rate limiting, right? So you have to understand the context of your organization. If you have a three person SOC, they're not going to be able to consume thousands of threat intelligence alerts or you know thousands of threat intelligence bullet bulletins. You have to make sure that you're providing a rate of intelligence that your organization can sustain. And lastly, you want to make sure that it's easily understood. So again, you know, they want to, in, in order for it to be consumable and so that, and for them to be able to take actions on it, you need to make sure that it is something that can be uh, analyzed and, and understood very quickly. So another key component of, of how we make this intelligence work for us is we incorporate our intelligence that we're creating into threat modeling. And then when you have a threat model for the organ or the uh, ransomware groups that are likely to more target your organization or industry vertical, then you have that informed threat hunting. Um, obviously, there's a whole other component here that is going to be built into making sure that there's proactive alerting, and that was basically you know the a lot of uh, the message from the previous talk. But really making sure that you're going through and informing all of the different hunts that you possibly could as a proactive measure is going to be extremely important. And so kind of lastly, throwing, throwing everything together here, one of the biggest calls to action that I have been focusing on with my team over the last two years has been threat intelligence sharing. And I think that overall, we do a pretty good job of threat intelligence sharing as an industry. You know, we do get IOCs out there. There's a lot of really great Twitter, um, Twitter accounts that are sharing intelligence on a regular basis and, and providing those up-to-date uh, IOCs. And I think that's great. But I think we could take it a step further. And I think we could share threat profiles between groups, between individuals, so that we are actually keeping everybody up-to-date. I think we could share tools and techniques, whether that's a configuration extractor for a ransomware uh, binary, or it's some way of making sure that we're tracking or, or um, ways of extracting other IOCs and information from specific ransomware um, variants and families. Sharing that emerging trends and, and, and research, I think is also uh, a really big component of making sure that we're staying and keeping everybody up to date. Um, a big thing here, right, is we want to make it difficult for the threat actors. And in order for, for us to do this, we have to share information even better and intelligence even better. So data sets, huge, you know, additionally analysis notes. There's a lot of really complex routines that a lot of threat actors create in their samples. And there's a lot of really brilliant people that are analyzing these malware samples on a regular basis. And they are extracting out uh, the methodology and, and intelligence from these samples but a lot of times it stays within the, the organization that that analyst works for. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to get in and start sharing these types of notes so that when this is seen by a different group, they're able to move fast and actually establish some of the different um, indicators and, and some of the different uh, behaviors that are um, being seen by other groups. So at the end of the day, you know, what I'm really going for here is share everything. I would much rather see more transparency between intelligence working groups, between organizations and individuals. Um, and ultimately, again, and I've hit on this a couple of different times, well, we have to make it harder for these threat actors to go through a rebrand. We have to make it harder for them to make slight changes to their ransomware and then continue operating. So really, again, let's just start sharing. 
um, I'll, 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 throw the call, I'll throw the call to action out there and say, my organization is ready to start sharing more. If you guys want to share more with us, please get into contact with us. We would love to do that. And I hope that by showing how valuable some of this intelligence sharing could be, that more organizations, more individuals will all take part in providing threat intelligence uh, to the community. So that's what I had for today. Um, I want to thank you for your time and, and definitely happy to, to answer any questions that you might have.